The organisers of the big day out have expressed their sadness at the death of a teenage girl who suffered a heart attack at the Sydney event on Friday evening. It's with great regret that we're here, as the loss of Jessica has shaken our organisation to its core. I cannot suitably express the pain, anguish and soul-searching that has affected our entire team since that day. The big day out has never compromised on uh, safety, nor will we ever compromise on safety. The big day out was created for people who love music and love life, so to lose a young, innocent life at our event has rocked the very foundations of our beliefs. We think that we have had the best festival in the world, and that's our intention to continue producing that show. 2002, the year the Big Day Out returned, contrary to much speculation. It was the year the Prodigy made their third Big Day Out appearance. New Order were back and were on tour to celebrate. She had were now pacifier. So what does she had mean? Well, now everyone knows. Yeah, <laughs> holy war. And Silverchair had returned to the charts. Garbage made their Big Day Out debut, as did legendary hip-hop crew Jurassic 5. 2002 was the year Alien Ant Farm ripped off Michael Jackson. And it was the year of a small band on the side stage, The White Stripes. After much soul searching and anguish, the organisers of the Big Day Out announced the festival would still go ahead. The festival conducted an online survey after the 2001 Limp Bizkit incident that resulted in the death of 16 year old Jessica Mikulik. As a result of the survey, Ken West and Vivian Lees decided the festival would continue in 2002, with bands including Garbage, New Order, Silverchair, Jurassic 5, Grinspoon, The Prodigy, Regurgitator, System of a Down, The White Stripes, The Crystal Method, Koshin and Basement Jacks. The 2002 year was really funny because in, in a certain extent it was like no more rules, no more what people want, no more about what the market thinks is right. It's like we need all of our mates you know, here because if this thing stuffs up this year, if we have any serious situations, it's over, absolutely gone. You know, we can't do it again emotionally, let alone physically. Um, the authorities were right on our back the whole way, which they should be to a certain extent. And so that's why we went, oh, let's bring up the project to close and, you know, New Order ran into and, and build that thing from the top down. And then we started to, to, you know, to, to introduce the heavier stuff in the second announcement because we wanted to kind of go, this is not... We, we're pulling, taking the pedal off the gas. Things like the white stripes, there's the little gems that were coming along, you know, to do to, to that. And, and, uh, and that was a, it was a great show all the way through because it was one of those things as each show went through, you start to go, oh, it's going to be all right, isn't it? It's the first time we've all gone through just dread at you know, nine o'clock in the morning as opposed to, wow, look, it's a nice day. Let's go and let's get out there and do it. It was dread and 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 kind of going, oh, we can do this. And 2002 was a real pleasure at the end of it, but it was a roller coaster ride. Can't get started. Can't make it hard. Now something a little more serious today. You guys got on stage and at four o'clock in the middle of your set. He actually performed a tribute to Jessica Mikulik, who uh, died as a result of injuries sustained during last year's Big Day Out, thanks to a crowd crush. He actually performed at her funeral. I think we're taking a look at the minute so a minute's noise here. <laughs> that, that must have been a very spun out thing to do in the, in the middle of a set, particularly a band like Green Spoon. I mean, you guys are used to these festivals. No, I think it was cool. I mean, everyone, it's in the back of everybody's mind out there, what happened last year, that kind of that everyone's lucky to be there this year. So, it, it, it was appropriate. The 2002 tour was dedicated to the memory of Jessica and the tragedy was still in the back of the artists and organisers' minds. Memories were brought flooding back when a barrier cracked during System of a Down's energetic set. The US Armenian group were no strangers to crowd violence. Only the year before, the band's attempt to play a free gig in LA was marred by rioting fans. 2002, that's one. That's right. Coming first time back in. First show, barrier crack after 2001, and, and it was just straight on to right, you know, 
talking to the audience. We're gonna go off stage for a while, blah, blah, blah. Not even in split seconds. Hesitation, and that was part of the new thing, is like making sure the bands know, you know, that, that who's who and what's an issue and what's not an issue. And, and, and we just insisted on no more middle people. That's one of the simple things we've introduced, which is that we do the, hello, I am, and this is the head of security, and this is the production manager. You know, before you're going on, if we'll do this and this, we just need a minute of your time, um, and they're, they're wrapped. Joining us right now from the band Shavo, the man on bass. How are you feeling today? Very well, thank you very much. How are you feeling? I'm feeling quite good. I'm feeling uh, relaxed that things haven't seemed to unfold it like they did in Los Angeles in September last year. Channel V were in fact on hand you were there. for a, uh, not myself personally, we had a camera crew there as uh, the crowd erupted when in fact your free outdoor gig was cancelled. And I'm thinking you guys seem to have a bit of a distrust of authority. Yeah, Potentially there was every, every LAPD that there is because they weren't supportive of the band at all. Although they'd been around since 1995, System of a Down had burst onto the mainstream scene in 2001 with their album Toxicity. They came on late in the afternoon, um, you know, daylight, where you haven't got the atmosphere of a live gig and still blew everyone away. I heard from first-hand audience members, if you like irony in your rock, System of a Down are the most hilarious act you've seen today. When I saw you play in Auckland, there was shenanigans on stage and it's something that a lot of people might not expect from a, a band as heavy as yourselves, that you would come out a lot more seriously, you know, with studded armbands and, you know, be a lot more intense, but you, you were intense, but at the same time you seemed to hell of, have a hell of a good time. Yeah, I mean, our whole vibe of System of a Down is to give the crowd and us a good time. I mean, when we're having a show, it's not only the crowd that's witnessing a show. The band is witnessing, is witnessing a show of not watching a band, but watching the crowd. So we gotta have fun, right? And if we're putting on, it's like an energy cycle. It goes from them to us, from us to them, from them to us. And the whole 45 minutes, hour, hour and a half that we play, it's like a cycle where it's like they feed us and we feed them and it just goes on and back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until it's over. And then we all ejaculate and we have an orgasm and we come and we say, oh, that was the greatest and now I have to go to sleep. One Hit Wonders Alien Ant Farm also made their Big Day Out debut in 2002. The US punk group had found success from their cover of Michael Jackson's Smooth Criminal. Now, uh, Smooth Criminal brought you a huge amount of success. Have you got any regrets about the success of that song? No. No, because we're here now and it's fun and it's, it's exposed us everywhere, so that's really cool. Oh, Alien Ant Farm, bunch of wankers, hated them. <laughs> they, took, they took the piss out of us for our band name and they're called Alien Ant Farm. Good on you lads, top name. These are some very special glasses that uh, some fans have made particularly for you because they actually thought you were called um, Alien Fly Farm. Hey, uh, I thought, I thought those were like little fly we, eyes. We changed our name, like we're, we're Australian Ant Farm now. Australian Ant Farm. Yeah. Australian Ant Farm. Yeah. of Alien Ant Farm's writer request, we want some uniquely Australian candy bars. 2006 will see Detroit duo The White Stripes headline The Big Day Out. It was just four years ago the brother, sister, husband, wife team made their first Big Day Out appearance on the side stages. I just saw The White Stripes, were like that was a real revelation for me seeing them because I'd never heard of them. And uh, my friends Rich and Sharon were there, from, uh, Rich used to be in Tomboy, and we just played, and they said, we got to see this band, the White Stripes, they're awesome. I'm like, who are they? And I just was blown away by their performance, and it was in Sydney at the side stage, and um, it was like an old 60s festival. It really reminded me of that, the sun setting, and it was, you know, it was a large, large crowd, but um, it wasn't really stadium rock. It was more like old school festival rock. Well, that was kind of their choice, too. I mean, he's a pretty clever guy. Um, um, they wanted to be into it. And I think after seeing them, I did find them was like, if you're really into someone and you just get a little bit like, oh, how are you going? And then I think I had really, really stinky breath that day, so I don't think he really wanted to talk to me. <laughs> 
It was a rotten tooth, all right? Rotten tooth, okay? I am clean. Disappointment watching that clip and thinking, or watching that, that live footage and thinking, there's no live tinkle, no invisible winging at the end, as there is in the film clip. Stick around, you might get it later. Is that something you might integrate into the Big Day Out tour? Well, I, I'm known to be, yeah, so it's possible. But probably not quite so publicly. And is there anyone that you've caught on the Big Day Out tour that's impressed you, other bands? I mean, there's tons, peaches, there's tons you've of stuff You've seen peaches? On. I love peaches. Sucking on my titties like you know you wanted to. Is, is that something you might integrate into the garbage performance? A nurse's outfit, a strap-on dildo? Not really, but I think you can get away with murder when you come from, you know, the art house of Berlin. So, she's doing her thing, it's great. You guys want some f***ing rock and roll music? Australian audiences were also introduced to Peaches, who joined Aussie favourites Regurgitator on stage for a version of her song, Rock Show. I, I remember Peaches, everyone talking about Peaches, um, the year that she played. That was pretty amazing just to watch her go from a, you know, a little obscure act that was filling in some slot at the Gold Coast, and by the time she got to Melbourne she was huge. That was really great to follow. Rock Show! You came to see her! She's a Canadian um, singer who lives in Berlin and she's, um, yeah, she's great. What kind of stuff does she do on stage at her own shows? She gives birth to a guitar, she, um, what else does she do? She's got a big penis. It's a big day out, so special. Jurassic 5! How many people heard of the J5? Yeah. Yeah, Jurassic 5, they don't Jewish, do they? Riders. Jewish? Yeah. Uh, no. Strictly no pork on the Jurassic 5 rider. Representing hip hop on the 2002 tour was US group Jurassic 5, a collective of rappers and DJs who'd risen from the rap underground in the 90s to a worldwide acclaim with their debut album, Quality Control, in 2000. Jurassic 5. Yeah. Jurassic 5. And because uh, they're my favourite man. Now, I gotta ask the dumbest question straight off the top. I'm sure you've answered this a million times. Jurassic 5, six members. <laughs> Sound better than Jurassic 6. Sound much better. No, actually, the name came up. Everybody was already in the group, and the name just stuck, you know? So we was like, we just gonna keep this. It's a real catchy thing. You can abbreviate it to J5. Call it a day. Anyone that was on that 2002 tour will just say Jurassic 5. Five with the act. They would just, every day, they would just come out and blow everyone else off stage. So, uh, who, who's the act that's impressed you the most on the Big Day Out tour? Uh, well, the Jurassic Five were really wicked. Next on BDO XV 2002, it's the return of Silverchair and Girling Eats Some Bad Fruit. <laughs> The 2002 Big Day Out was another milestone for Channel V, this time with the V Music Bus travelling on the tour and broadcasting live from every Australian city. Interviewing bands at the Big Day Out, and the, the way we do it with the Channel V live broadcast can sometimes be very difficult because, you know, it's such a big venue and bands being rushed from one place to the other and taken upstairs and whatever, and they sit down for two minutes, they go and they go. Um, so it's not really the in-depth kind of, you know, tell us about how your relationship with your father affected your music kind of interview. It's more like, you know, so who have you got a crush on? Now, uh, you, you played earlier today. Well, how was the show it today? It doesn't happen. To yeah, it was good. Yeah, yeah. One of my favourite moments was Girling, I think, had just ingested some sort of something. I can't remember what it was, but they were... Uh, we were doing a live broadcast and the, the, the preview monitor that we had was, was showing the satellite delay, which was about three or four seconds behind what we were doing and they couldn't figure out how they were in a time shift. They'd do this, and then see their hand go like that there and go... Oh! Paul, can you turn the TV off, please? No, the, the show is good. <laughs> off we go. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I loved, of course, Girling's interview with Jabba when they were um, a little bit inebriated. You know, who knows? Maybe they were on acid. I reckon they were. It was a good show. <laughs> what happened? No, no, you've lost your spot now. You're being naughty. <laughs> and I didn't really have any good questions, you know, with girling. It's just like, hey, blah, blah, talk shit. Hopefully someone will chop it up. Someone is live. You just kind of, you know, 
it's killing time until someone goes, all right, you know, throw to their performance. So I guess it was just entertainment because I didn't have any good questions. They didn't have any good answers, but they were just the format of television. It was a good show. Did you throw in any Michael Jackson covers? Yeah, look, up to you. Yeah, they were loving it. What about you? The strangest thing you've seen at the big day out? Uh, probably the strangest band is the Ching Up the Ratio. Girl of my dreams, just give me nightmares. We're live at the big day out 2002. A man in front of Karen Brock, Chitchat Von Lupenstab, Pinky Beecroft from Hello. the magnificent Australian 12 piece machine gun fellatio. One of my favourite moments actually would be with machine gun fellatio, again in Adelaide. And they, they seem to have a, a, an attack of the girlings. They weren't really too sure what was happening with the camera and they, they laughed a lot. Chitchat, Love Shark, they thought it was all very funny. We stole this. Chat, we stole this from the VIP tent. No, no, they didn't steal it. They borrowed it. No, we stole, we stole it. Stole it. No, and we're really taking it on the plane. No, they're going to take much. it back straight away after it's this. Good. The theme of the big day out that year was um, was bowling. They had ten pin bowling, and they had these little bowling sets in the in the um, the band, you know, the, the eating areas. Anyway, we stole one, of course. We just nicked one, took it to the airport with us to play, and started playing this bowling game. And Pinky was just yelling out, I missed a strike, I missed a strike. Anyway, our plane to Perth got delayed, so we kept on drinking Eskimo's Joe's Rider, who we'd also nicked Eskimo Joe's Rider. Anyway, Pinky has chased this bunch of um, Swedish schoolgirls off somewhere into a different part of the airport when the plane was finally leaving. So we had to find him and we're thinking, how do we find him? So one of our smart ass um, sound crew guy went up to the counter and got him paged. So it said, paging Mr. Strike, Mr. Strike to the uh, departure lounge. And so that became the name of the album. Were you there was the Blue Lake. Were you signed Mighty? the Blue Lake. Human were you sacrifices. It was like a dream. It was, uh, we were just starting to break. It was really starting to happen for us. And we played um, in the Gold Coast and we're terrified because they put us on at 7.30 at night and we're up against um, John Butler and there's a lot of big headline acts. We're really nervous and we did the show and we had about 4,000 in this tent which to us was very exciting and then we turned up to Sydney and we thought, oh, we were in earlier on the day, it's about 1 o'clock and we said, oh, we'll see how we go. We had, I think, 18,000 people. Uh, it was just incredible. A sea of people and they were singing along and I just thought, this is it. My life is never going to get better than this moment. And it was just so cool. And also, we got a sense then, because we were, in our own way, a travelling circus. Like, we're travelling... We had, I think we had 15 people touring with us as our entourage. But to be part of a, a proper circus like that, where it was, you know, they, they break down the tents and they rebuild them in another town. And it was just... It was a great, great experience. And it's a one flat pig to get started. Give me two flat pig to get started. Does everybody like Silverchair here? <laughs> interviewing them soon and on their rider they insist on having two whole chickens. Oh, they do not. They do. I absolutely swear this is true as well as washed fresh whole fruit. You must not cut Silverchair's fruit. You know what's going on with the chickens? Silverchair have this thing, they have this obsessive thing where they need to blow things up backstage. They take firecrackers in, put them into tomatoes and blow them up. I'm thinking they're moving on to chickens, Yumi. Two thousand and two was also the year Silverchair returned to the big day out. The Newcastle trio, who played the festival in 1995, had managed to rack up a swag of number one hits since then, and had released their most ambitious album to date, Diorama. Given that you are the Australian band that have created more top 20 hits than any other Australian act, you've sold six million albums worldwide, and your first album, Frog Stomp, recorded in just nine days but your latest album diorama you've been working on it for months i think it's just the way it's kind of turned out i think the stuff on this album was probably a little bit more complex than the the last the former album so it took a little bit more time to do but uh, uh, considering rock stomp's not complex yeah i oh know it's very complex <laughs> deep now you know real deep super deep oh yeah how how deep is deep how low can you go I know Daniel Johns has given it a, a lot of thought. It's something that he spends many hours each day just thinking, when I come, I mean, a dolphin, is that what I want to be, a giraffe, a leaf on a tree? Daniel, what would you want to come back at? I would like to come back as a piece of plankton shaped as a marble so I could roll along the seabed and pick up what I saw fit. It's a bit like the closing credits of Sea Change. 
where the, I've been watching a lot of sea change, where the marble drops into the water, rolls to the bottom, and like these pebbles here, it bumps into another rock, a lot like the inhabitants in the town. Maybe that's my destiny, sea change. Next on BDO XV 2002, James experiences the craziness of the lily pad, and we find out why Jack White owes the big day out $130. Yeah. The 2002 Channel V broadcast of the Big Day Out also included a live show from the unpredictable and crazy lily pad. Now I'm here with Larry, who's one of the, the brainchild, one of the uh, founding members, one of the, I guess, staples of the lily pad. He's here with his harem of uh, mud wrestling girls. And Larry, tell people at home who don't know a little bit about the uh, lily pad exactly what goes on here. Well, basically the idea was as a promoter of the Big Day Out, I uh, got sick of hanging around backstage with guys in black t-shirts. Decided I'd create a forum for mud bathing with a whole lot of gorgeous young chicks. We did the show live from the lily pad, which was probably a major risk at the time and probably something that um, could have cost me my job in a way because if you've ever seen the lily pad, it's a slightly unpredictable affair. Here we go, this is the lily pad wet jock competition. One for the ladies. And now yes. we'd like to ask the other contestants to leave the stage. And wet. now these two lovely pair will perform a small erotic dance for you. Courtesy of VTV and the producers of Fantasmo. We had uh, James Matheson, then still kind of a green presenter, I suppose, in a way. And he had to host a show from the lily pad. A lot of language went to air that perhaps isn't allowed to go to air in, uh, on any channel in Australia. And I remember at the time, that four hour show really felt like four years. And uh, I don't think James has ever forgiven me, but um, there were some moments of uh, absolute insanity that James would never put himself through on television ever again. The great Channel V moment was when James Matheson and uh, his young mate were presenting, uh, doing live crosses from the lily pad. And James, a very smart man, very witty, um, you know, he was doing really well at presenting. And then all of a sudden, Someone, I think it was uh, Christo or Heavy G, just tipped a whole can, like three cans of baked beans all over James, and he just didn't bat an eyelid. Today we're coming to you from the lily pad, one of the more alternative stages here, at the Big Day Out 2002. And uh, as we continue, we see we've got some mud wrestling happening to our right. It's all about getting dirty, getting into it, and watching chicks in bikinis wrestle in the mud. He's just seeing there, well that, that's it Dan, we're closing, we're sending you back to the boiler room from the lily pad. He didn't miss a beat, that was, I was really impressed with his professionalism. And now if we could just, for the cameras one more time, show us the technique again? that won the title. Two girls oh. snogging, come on girls, do it for me, please. We'd love to see Here's it, we really, really would. One more Yay! time, with feeling. Make some noise guys. The lily pad is like a free form party system which is interactive for uh, the kids at the, at, the, uh, at the shows. There's no barrier between the lily pad stage and the audience. We invite people in to participate. Um, a lot of the time it's musically based but we also present a lot of cabaret underground acts that uh, wouldn't normally be considered for uh, appearances at the big day out. So we're sort of like a little escape valve. Um, and yeah, it's just a great place for people to hang and get lost and time doesn't really matter at the lily pad. Backstage on the tour, all eyes were on the white stripes. Speculation surrounded the pair who claimed to be brother and sister. Jack White owes me a hundred and $30 New Zealand because I got a phone call at 4.15 in the morning after the Auckland show from the, and I had to get up at 6 to catch the flight which is and I only had two hours of sleep so I wasn't too excited saying uh, Mr West and I go, yeah, and, um, one of your artists has broken no has no one of your artists has thrown a glass through one of our walls downstairs and, and I went uh, okay, you know which one said, oh, I don't know. I said, well, what, what are you? I said, we'll need to charge you, put it on your tab. And I went, how much is that? I said, oh, 130, a bit of plaster work on it. And I said, oh, okay. 
But it's funny because the White Stripes were there and they were playing before us on some of the stages, which was, you know, I had that first album, I thought they're pretty cool, but everyone, it was when that, you know, whole thing, is she married to him, are they brother and sister, you know, whatever. Anyway, so everyone hit on them, on her, obviously, because she's just, you know, she's got these big cannons and everyone's gone, Meg, hey, what are you doing? Obviously, you're with your brother. Anyway, the guy from the Crystal Method went a little bit too far and, and Jack punched him out. In the, in the band room, just, which was great. This was like second show in, we're thinking, cool, this is gonna be a tour we're gonna like. Was, uh, was that the night you and Adam got into a fist fight? That could have been. <laughs> what was the fist fight over? They have no idea, both of them don't we, remember we it at all. We couldn't remember the next day. Perhaps uh, over, uh, over the no, affections of, of, of it all. Uh, could have been, so. could have been. And I found out later he does knock people's heads off, so I'm not gonna confront him too much about it, but I'm trying to put it on a settlement. Minus one and thirty dollars for damages two thousand and you know, one. The two thousand and two big day out ended with more than two hundred and fifteen thousand festival goers attending the event. The controversial D barricade that had been implemented was hailed as success, with no serious injuries reported and significantly less minor injuries. Next time on BDO XV, it's 2003, the year of rock with the Foo Fighters, Queens of the Stone Age, Jane's Addiction and The Vines.